Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Charts with Dan. I know the show's up at a bit of a different time today. That's because my review for Avatar The Way of Water went live this morning when this show usually goes live, so I had to push back a little bit into the afternoon. If you want to see that review of Avatar The Way of Water, you can check it out right now. It's a movie that we're going to be talking about during this very episode. My predictions for how it's going to open at the box office this weekend. We also have a lot to talk about with Black Adam. We mentioned it a little bit last week, but The Rock has been weighing in, so we're going to talk about just how much money that movie might actually be making and a lot more. Before we get to any of that though, I want to thank my partner here on the show as always, Carbon Health. As we get into not just the holiday season, but the cold and flu season, Carbon Health is there for you. You can download the app right now to see if there's a Carbon Health location near you, or if there's not, you can also use Carbon Health to do virtual appointments if you can't make it into an office. Carbon Health offers all kinds of healthcare services, including flu shots and updated COVID-19 vaccinations, and they also keep a certain number of appointments open every day for walk-ins because they understand that you can't always schedule when you have to go to see the doctor. Download the Carbon Health app right now to learn more. I'm happy to have them as my sponsor because I support their mission, which is to get health care to as many people as possible as affordably as possible. So thank you as always to Carbon Health for being my partner here on the show. And let's look at the box office for this past weekend as we ramp up to the holiday season. It was one of the worst, I think the second worst weekend of 2022 so far. Not a lot of people going to the movies, but the ones that did by and large went to see Black Panther Wakanda Forever. In its fifth week at the box office takes a 35.9% drop for for an $11.2 million total. Violent Night stays in second place in its second week, a 35% drop for an $8.7 million total. Strange World stays in third place in its third week with a 25.6% drop and a $3.7 million total. Not much really to help out with that box office loss, but hey, you know, I guess it's still in the top five. The Menu stays at number four in its fourth week with a 20.3% drop and a $2.7 million total. Devotion stays in the fifth spot in its third week with a 26.6% drop and a $1.9 million total. So the top five actually unchanged from last week. Looking at the top six through 10, Black Adam is at number six. It actually goes up one spot from last week. In its eighth week of release, a 15.1% drop for a $1.3 million total. The Fablemans expanded to about 300 more theaters. It's actually now just shy of wide release, but the box office still went down 7.7% for a $1.1 million total. At number eight was a live stream of the Metropolitan Opera. They mounted an opera based on The Hours, which also spawned the Academy Award winning film. Nicole Kidman won an Oscar for that film. $791,000 total, good enough for number eight on the chart. I Heard the Bells dropped 62.5% from last week's event, but still good enough for a top 10 finish with $750,000. And then the film Spoiler Alert had a big expansion in week two. It will expand further this weekend. It jumped 719% from last week for a $679,000 total. Dropping out of the top 10, Bones and All after just two weeks, and Ticket to Paradise, which opened the same week as Black Adam, but doesn't quite last in the top 10 as long, a seven-week run in the top 10 for the George Clooney, Julia Roberts rom-com. Looking at the road to recovery, you see there, that's the green line. It is well below where we are on average or where we were from 2015 to 2019, the pre-COVID years. And you can also see we are below where we were last year in 2021. As I mentioned, we narrowly avoided this past weekend being the worst weekend at the box office this year. Of course, with the release of Avatar The Way of Water, that line should jump up substantially next week, but still just another indication that we are having a very lackluster back half of the box office season. And this weekend does bring the long, 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 long awaited opening of Avatar The Way of Water. And one of the big questions is, how is this movie going to do? Is James Cameron going to be able to recapture the magic? Are we going to be putting butts in seats? Will we get another biggest movie of all time? It's a question that I've certainly been turning over in my head because this movie is so hard for me to figure out what I think it's going to do. Because on the one hand, you have the anticipation factor. You have the fact that Avatar was the biggest movie of all time when it came out. James Cameron just keeps doing that. And the idea of doubting James Cameron seems stupid because every time you doubt him, he comes out and makes the biggest thing ever. But at the same time, you have to wonder, 
How much interest is there still in Avatar in the decade plus since it came out? Will people be going out to spend their money at the theaters? Is this the movie they've been waiting to see? There are so many different elements that are weighing for and against this movie that predicting what it's going to do is a pretty tough task. But I decided to try my hand at it with the caveat that I have almost no confidence in this prediction. This is almost more of just a, a gut instinct type thing. So let's look at my prediction for how Avatar The Way of Water will open. Tracking was reported a couple weeks ago at 150 to $175 million. So that's the estimate where the industry figures, whomever they are, feel the movie will open. The original Avatar opened in 2009 to $77 million. It just had an exceptionally long run at the box office. When you adjust that number for inflation, that's an opening of just over over $106 million. And so let's get to my prediction. I'm predicting that Avatar The Way of Water is going to open slightly below tracking at $140 million. That's an 81.6% increase from the original if you don't adjust for inflation. That would be the fifth highest opening of 2022, the sixth highest opening of December. And some people might look at that figure and say, well, Dan's projecting that Avatar The Way of Water is going to flop. No, actually, I'm not predicting that. I'm just not predicting as front-loaded a box office weekend as a lot of other people are. Why is that? Well, I have a few reasons. Number one, the length of the film. It's three hours and 12 minutes. You just can't get as many showings packed into a day. Number two, premium format screens. This is a movie that I think people are going to want to see in IMAX, in 3D, in the high frame rate. And I think that there are some people who will want to see it in those formats this weekend. It will be sold out. And instead of going to see it in a different format, they'll wait. They'll say, okay, well, you know what? I'll go see it over the Christmas holiday. I'll wait a week to see if the crowd dies down. This is one where I think people will wait to see it in a better format than the ones that might be available on the opening weekend. And then the other reason, the extended business window due to the holidays. We see this a lot where a movie opens in mid-December or close to Christmas, and then it plays all through the Christmas holiday and into January. I think that's what we're going to see with Avatar The Way of Water. So yes, I am projecting that it's going to open a little bit below tracking at 150 40 million dollars and if it does then i can almost promise you that the news will be breathlessly reporting that avatar flopped and it came in below expectations and oh my god what's going to happen it's a long holiday season and james cameron has shown us many times over at this point that he makes movies that people will go to see over a long period of time i will say i think there's a lot of wiggle room here I don't think there's a whole lot of wiggle room down. I think if it if it debuts much below $140 million, I might even raise my eyebrows at that. But I think that there is a lot of wiggle room up. If you were to tell me that Avatar hit that $150 million or $175 million, if you were to tell me that Avatar hit the $200 million mark, I would not be surprised because as I always say, you really can't track enthusiasm. That's why my confidence, my probability of being wrong, I say is very high. My confidence in this is very low. This really is just gut instinct, my gut feeling on this. And I would not be shocked if this movie went a lot higher. So that's my prediction for Avatar The Way of Water. We'll come back next week and perhaps laugh at my chilling lack of foresight, but my prediction is a $140 million opening this weekend with a healthy and very long tail on the end of its box office performance. One movie that could have used a better tail on its box office performance is Black Adam. I covered its opening weekend, which I thought was pretty strong, but it did not have that closing speed that a lot of people thought that it might, given the fact that it had several weeks with no real substantial competition until Black Panther Wakanda Forever came out. Last week, I mentioned an article that was put out by Variety about how Black Adam faces losses in the theatrical market, but there was actually some pushback on that, first from Deadline, which is another one of the trades, the Hollywood Insider Trade Publications, which published kind of a snarky article saying like, well, when we talk to the people that do this for a living, here's why Black Adam is going to make money. There is nothing less consequential or that the participants take more seriously than a cat fight between two Hollywood trades. Then the funny thing is, is that Variety only said that Black Adam was going to lose money in the theatrical window, which by the way, even by Deadline's own numbers, is definitely true. So it was really a pushback from Deadline against a statement from Variety that Variety never really made. And then The Rock himself tweeted out the article from Deadline and said, well, yeah, see, the movie is going to make a profit, even though Variety never really said the movie wasn't going to make a profit. It just said it wasn't going to be profitable in the theatrical window. My point being, let's look at these numbers. Let's look at what Deadline published as the path to profitability for 
Black Adam. And as you can see, this is the source from Deadline. It nailed production costs for Black Adam down at $338 million. That would be a $195 million budget, $100 million spent on marketing, and then $43 million in profit participation. Basically, this is when The Rock says, hey, you know, I'm going to star in the movie, but I'm going to get X percent of the gross. That's what that means. So you're losing $43 million to pay off those folks. And then the production revenue deadline projected at $390 million, including $184 million from global box office revenue, $113 million from global home entertainment. That would be streaming, premium video on demand, Blu-ray sales, etc., and then $93 million in global TV deals for a total net profit of $52 million. And that was basically what Deadline and then The Rock were trumpeting. They said that Black Adam was going to be profitable to the tune of $50 to $70 million. And given those numbers, yes. But the point that a lot of people were making is that even if Black Adam does make a profit, it's a pretty razor thin margin. And that's evidenced very well by a little blurb in that Hollywood Reporter story. I covered this story last week that was talking about Wonder Woman 3 not moving forward and the potential pitfalls for the DCEU moving forward. They reported in that story that some insiders at Warner Brothers had said that the budget for Black Adam was closer to $230 million than $195 million. Now, there's been no confirmation of that, but let's look at that profit margin. If just a couple of things change based off of the numbers that Deadline laid out, let's bump that number up from that $190, $195 million to the $230 million that THR reported. Now, the $100 million in marketing cost will keep that the same. The $43 million in profit participation, Jumanji, the next level, had about $88 million laid aside for that. So you're basically cutting that in half, but you have a lot less star power in Black Adam, even though The Rock is in both movies. So I'll actually let that stand and say that you're only giving away $43 million in profit participation. Now let's look at the production revenue. $184 million in global box office. That doesn't change. We know what those numbers are. The global home entertainment number, though, the deadline article had it slated at $113 million, but I'm not quite so sure that it's going to go up that high. That would be roughly equivalent to what Jumanji The Next Level generated in global home entertainment, which had an estimated $51.4 million in Blu-ray and DVD sales when it was released back in March of 2020. That's according to the numbers.com. But Black Adam begins streaming this week on HBO Max before any physical media release. So it's a little hard for me to believe that Black Adam is going to do just as well on Blu-ray, DVD, etc. when it's already available on a streamer than Jumanji The Next Level did when it was not yet available on streaming. Keep in mind also that any money that Sony got for Jumanji The Next Level licensing that movie to stars, Warner Brothers doesn't get that immediately because it's going to HBO Max. Warner Brothers already owns HBO Max, so that's a little bit of money that you're giving away. But I I'm actually not going to downgrade the global home entertainment number drastically. I'm going to say that it goes down from $113 million to $90 million. I think that that's safe, fair, and reasonable. The other revenue stream that Deadline had down was the global TV revenue stream, which it had down as $93 million. Again, it's a little tougher for me to say that Black Adam is going to make quite as much money uh, because of the HBO Max situation in global TV revenue, but I'm also not going to downgrade that too much. I'm just going to bring it down from $93 million to $80 million. So you'll see, even with just a modest downgrade from the numbers that Deadline provided and a little bit of an uptick in the budget, we go from a profit on Black Adam of over $50 million to a total net loss of $19 million. I'm not saying that Black Adam is going to lose money. I'm saying that for all the talk of the fact that it is going to be profitable, there is not a whole lot of wiggle room and all of the numbers that are provided have to be pretty much exactly on the money for that to hold up. So the overall point, I think, that's being made and the reason that Warner Brothers Discovery is is also reportedly taking a second look at making a Black Adam sequel is yes okay maybe the movie did make a little bit of money but that's a pretty thin margin I think that's the overall look of things however there is one thing that The Rock tweeted that I can push back on pretty concretely no pun intended and that was a comparison that he made in his initial tweet saying that Black Adam was going to be profitable he said almost 400 million dollars worldwide we are building our new franchise step by step First Captain America did $370 million. So basically, he's justifying the performance of Black Adam by saying, well, it's roughly on par with the performance of the first Captain America film basically saying that it's a building block for the DC Universe, much like Captain America the First Avenger was a building block for the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Well, let's look at those two numbers side by side. 
Black Adam is there on the left. Captain America, the first Avenger, is there on the right. And the first big difference between these two is the budget. Again, we'll go with the conservative figure that we were given for Black Adam. A $190 million budget for Black Adam. A $140 million budget for Captain America, the first Avenger. So a $50 million difference there. Domestic gross, about the same. Black Adam brought in $166.8 million to date. Captain America, the first Avenger brought in $176.6 million to date. Worldwide gross, again, pretty similar. Black Adam a little bit higher than Captain America the First Avenger, currently about $389.1 million worldwide to Captain America the First Avenger's $370.5 million. But putting aside the fact that I just think in general that's a flawed comparison, The Rock is a much bigger star at this point in his career than Chris Evans was when Captain America the First Avenger came out, and the DC Universe is much more established than the Marvel Universe when Captain America the First Avenger came out. There's also a big thing The Rock didn't do, and it's something that we love to do on the show say it with me kids adjust for inflation and when we adjust those numbers for inflation the budget numbers actually line up a lot closer captain america the first avengers budget adjusted for inflation is at 185.4 million dollars but you also see that its domestic gross jumps up when adjusted for inflation it outdoes black adam by about 70 million dollars domestically and then given the caveat that you can't really adjust exactly for what the difference might be in exchange rates, Captain America the First Avenger tops Black Adam by about $100 million worldwide. And these are the kind of box office arguments that drive me crazy because The Rock is a pretty smart guy. and He probably knew that comparing his movie to a movie that came out over a decade ago was probably not a valid box office comparison, but he's out there sticking up for his film. I just think that it is a flawed argument, and I think that you do have to break down those kinds of flawed arguments. Really what the bottom line of all of this is, is that Black Adam is a very borderline case. Yes, it had a strong start, I still believe, domestically, but it wasn't able to close the deal. And when Warner Brothers Discovery is looking at what they're going to do, I understand their reticence to say, are we really going to invest this much more in Black Adam? Is the audience really going to be that much more excited about it unless we massively up the stakes and pour a lot more money into it? That is a question that is probably being worked out maybe literally as I speak in the Warner Brothers Discovery boardrooms as James Gunn and Peter Safran begin to present what their vision for the DC Universe is to David Zaslav. But it's not as open and shut a case as The Rock and some of the trades would have you believe. I think that Black Adam's future is very much up in the air, and I'll be very curious to see what they decide to do with it going forward. Before we move on with today's show, I want to thank one of our sponsors, Athletic Greens, the makers of AG1. You've been hearing about Athletic Greens on the show for quite a while now. I started taking it because I'm looking to support better gut health and overall better me. And during this cold and flu season, anything you can do to boost your body's immune system is a plus. So what is this stuff? Well, with one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and more to help you start your day right. Taking AG1 is super simple. I can either put a scoop right into a cup of water or mix it into a shake. Either way, it's a quick and tasty way for me to start my day off right and make sure that I'm supporting not only my gut health, but my immune system, my recovery, focus, and so much more. AG1 is lifestyle friendly and contains less than one gram of sugar with no GMOs or artificial anything. And Athletic Greens also cares about the world. They donate to organizations helping to get nutrition Nutritious food to kids in need, including No Kid Hungry, right here in the U.S. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com Dan. Again, that is athleticgreens.com Dan to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Let's look at the top five movies this weekend per theater, and we did set a mark for 2022, even though the overall box office was at its lowest or almost lowest for the year. The Whale set the mark for the highest per theater average of the year at $60,000 per theater in each of its six theaters. That's not a final figure. That's one of the final numbers that had not come in as of the time that I was recording this video. The Trial was at number two with $7,280. That's a 4K remaster. 
of Orson Welles' 1962 film starring Anthony Perkins. At number three was The Sparring Partner with just over $4,300 per theater in each of its 13 theaters. That's a courtroom drama out of Hong Kong. At number four in just one theater is 752 is not a number. This movie is from Iranian filmmaker Babak Payami about the aftermath of the shooting down of Ukrainian Flight 752 by Iran several years ago. And then at number five is Black Panther Wakanda Forever, $3,016 per theater in each of its 3,725 theaters, the only wide release on this list. As I mentioned, The Whale, the highest per theater average of the year, it beats out everything everywhere all at once, which was way back in March, believe it or not. So unless another movie can come out and make more than $60,000 per theater, The Whale is going to be your per theater champion for 2022. It just has to hang on for a couple more weekends. Everything everywhere all at once at number two with $50,000 per theater, followed by The Banshees of Minas Sharon back in October with $46,000 per theater in four theaters. Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness and Black Panther Wakanda Forever holding it down for the MCU at numbers four and five, nearly identical per theater numbers at just over $41,000. Looking at the top five in limited release this past weekend, The Fablemans I mentioned stayed just under the 1,000 theater margin to be in limited release. It brings in just over $1.1 million in its fifth week. The Met Opera, The Hours, is at number two with $791,000, followed by Spoiler Alert at number three with $679,000. By far the smallest theater count on this list was The Whale, playing in just six theaters, but a total of $360,000. And then really just a catchy name here, Evangelion 3.0 plus 1.01, Thrice Upon a Time, playing in 726 theaters. It was a multi-night event. Only one of them happened to coincide with the weekend box office. This was a revised version of the 2021 film, wrapping up Rebuild of Evangelion, which is spun off from the series Neon Genesis Evangelion. So it's basically a special edition of a sequel and a smaller franchise that's part of a larger franchise. And yes, that did take me a lot of research time to figure out. Looking at the top movies that were released in limited release this year, Glass Onion and Knives Out Mystery remains number one with an estimated $15 million. We just don't know exactly how much money it made because Netflix likes to be coy. The Banshees of Sharon is at number two. Brahmastra Part 1 Shiva is at number three. The Fablemans moves up to number four with a total of $7.3 million, followed by BTS Permission to Dance dropping one spot to number five. KGF Chapter 2 dropping to six. Marcel the Shell with Shoes On dropping to seven. The portion of Terrifier 2 to release when it was in limited releases at number eight orphan first kill stays at number nine and pony and selvan part one stays at number 10 looking outside the boundaries of the domestic box office meaning not the united states or canada we have the top five films internationally at least the ones that i could find and Black Panther Wakanda Forever stays at the top of this chart with $11.8 million. At number two, getting a jump start in several markets is Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, which we won't get for a couple weeks here. Domestically, $8.9 million. One Piece Film Red is at number three with $4.7 million. Violent Night at number four with $4.5 million. And then at number five, the South Korean film The Owl, which we have seen on this chart before, with $4.1 million. So when you combine the international chart with the domestic chart, you get our top films worth worldwide. At number one is Black Panther Wakanda Forever, a 22.9 million addition to its global box office take. Violent Nights at number two with 13.2 million, followed by Puss in Boots, The Last Wish at 8.9 million. Strange World at number four with 7.3 million, and The Menu at number five with 6.3 million. Looking at the 2022 domestic box office top 10, there is no change, at least not today. Black Panther Wakanda Forever is just short of Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness by less than $2 million. It will take the number two spot next week. Of course, Top Gun Maverick remains at number one. Jurassic World Dominion and Minions, The Rise of Gru, remain at numbers four and five. The Batman is at number six. Thor Love and Thunder at number seven. Sonic the Hedgehog 2 at number eight. Black Adam at number nine. Elvis at number 10 with $151 million. And if Avatar The Way of Water opens where tracking is anticipating, then it will be one of the top 10 movies at the domestic box office by this time next week. If it opens where I think it's going to, then it'll be just short. We'll just have to see what happens. Looking at the worldwide box office for this year, we're just short of a change in the top five, but it remains unchanged for now. Top Gun Maverick, Jurassic World Dominion, the only two billion dollar grocers of the year so far. Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness and Minions The Rise of Gru at numbers three and four. The Batman is at number five, but about three million dollars behind it is Black Panther Wakanda Forever. It will take that number five spot next week. Thor 11 Thunder drops down to number seven. The Battle at Lake Chongjin 2 is at number eight. Moon Man is at number nine. 
Klein, and Fantastic Beasts The Secrets of Dumbledore is at number 10. Let's look at the worldwide box office over the previous 365 days. So you take today's date, you roll it back one calendar year. These are the top 10 movies over that period of time. And this may be the last time we see this chart for a while because it's going to be pretty redundant. And that's because Spider-Man No Way Home is going to rotate off of this chart next week. And the top 10 movies will basically just be the top 10 movies worldwide for this year. So we may retire this until we have some other movies that uh, rotate on this chart in 2023 and kind of shake things up a bit. But Spider-Man No Way Home is going to retire at the top of the chart, $1.9 billion. Top Gun Maverick at number two, Jurassic World Dominion at number three, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness at number four, Minions The Rise of Gru at number five, The Batman at number six for now, but Black Panther Wakanda Forever is right behind it at number seven, Thor Love and Thunder is at number eight, The Battle at Lake Chung Gen 2 is at number 9, and Moon Man is at number 10. Now we come to the part in the show where I take a look at a weekend in box office past and also pay tribute to some people that have passed away that left a lasting legacy in film and television. And there was a name I wanted to mention that actually was just reported as I was prepping the show. And that's composer Angelo Badalamenti, whose work spans so many different genres. He did the music for National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation and A Nightmare on Elm Street 3 Dream Warriors, two of my favorite seasonal films. But he will probably best be remembered for his collaboration with David Lynch. He did the music for Twin Peaks and for so many of David Lynch's films. Mulholland Drive, which was named to the Sight and Sound Poll Top 10 last week. I always loved Angelo Badalamenti's music because it was so durable because you could listen to his score in a Christmas movie and then not realize that in this weird, you know, Lost Highway movie that you were watching next, it was the same guy. He really was a composer that could make any sort of music. And especially for David Lynch fans, his legacy will live on for many, many years to come. So Angelo Badalamenti passing away yesterday. As always, my thoughts go to his friends, family, fans, and collaborators. Good morning. It's December 12, 2022, and it's a Monday. Today, no music. Let's take a look now at a weekend in box office past, and we're going to go back nearly 40 years to this exact matching weekend, December 9th through the 11th, the 49th weekend of the year, 1983, which saw the debut of Sudden Impact, the latest film in the Dirty Harry series, and the one that made Go Ahead, Make My Day a classic movie moment. It was number one over Brian De Palma's Scarface, which opened that same weekend in 1983, starring Al Pacino, $4.5 million debut. In third place was the eventual Best Picture winner for 1983 terms of endearment and its third week as it expanded it made 4.2 million dollars in third place at number four from john carpenter christine with a 3.4 million dollar debut so scarface sudden impact and christine three big movies from the 80s all debuting the same weekend and then at number five barbara streisand in yentl in its fourth week making just over three million dollars but as we look at weekends in the past especially when we go as far back as 1983 you know what I like to do, which is to hit that inflation button and see what it would look like translated into today's dollars. And we see that Sudden Impact would have had a $28.9 million opening. Scarface would have opened to $13.7 million, followed by $12.7 million for Terms of Endearment, $10.1 million for Christine, and $9.1 million for Barbara Streisand in Yentl. We will keep charting in just a moment, but I want to thank another one of our sponsors this week, Raycon. The holidays are fast, and I mean fast approaching. We are less than two weeks away from Christmas. Hanukkah is less than a week away. And if you're scrambling for that last minute gift, scramble no more because Raycon audio products are here for you. Raycon's wireless earbuds, headphones, and speakers offer premium sound, useful features, and almost custom comfortable fit and up to 54 hours of battery life. Your friends and family will be able to start using them right away, maybe to start a Christmas dance party around the tree, or just slip in those Raycon earbuds to drown out Uncle Joey's latest ramblings at the family dinner. And as the person gifting Raycon, you've got to love that they start at half the price of other premium audio brands. And this month, Raycon's having a countdown to Christmas with a new pop up flash deal for you to take advantage of every single day. 
Also, from December 13th to the 20th, you can get free express shipping on orders over $85 when you use the special promo code HOLIDAY to make sure that those Raycon products get under the tree. Right now, go to buyraycon.com slash Merle to get 15% off site-wide with code HOLIDAY plus free shipping. That's code HOLIDAY at buy, B-U-Y, Raycon.com slash Merle, M-U-R-R-E-L-L for 15% off of your Raycon purchase, buyraycon.com slash Merle. Before we wrap up the show, as always, I like to take a look at the streaming charts to see what people are watching home through various different services. And we will start first off with the iTunes store where the Grinch has snuck his way up to the top spot. We are truly in the holiday season. Illuminations, the Grinch with Benedict Cumberbatch voicing the characters at number one. Black Adam is at number two, still only available for purchase and premium video on demand. So adding to that, hopefully net profit for the film there. Top Gun Maverick stays at number three. Triangle of Sadness is at number four. This is a movie that I just caught up on as I'm trying to catch the big movies at the end of the year for awards season. Dolly De Leon gives a fantastic supporting performance in this movie. She is somebody that I think we should watch as a potential dark horse candidate in the awards season. How the Grinch Stole Christmas starring Jim Carrey is at number five. Elf is at number six. Rankin and Bass's Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer is at number seven. She Said, which is another awards season hopeful that's fading a little bit as we get into the season, is at number eight. Available for purchase and premium video on demand. The Holiday starring Jack Black Kate Winslet and more is at number nine and Ticket to Paradise available for purchase is at number 10. Looking at the most watched programs on Netflix for the week of November 28th through December the 4th, Wednesday begins its phenomenal run at the top of the charts. Its first full week on the service saw another 411.2 million hours watched for a PFV of 62.9. That means that 62.9 million Netflix users could potentially have finished viewing Wednesday based on the hours watched and the runtime of the series. That's a massive number. The Netflix movie Troll is at number two. This this is a movie out of Norway that got a lot of traction. I saw a lot of people online talking about Troll. I may have to check that one out. My Name is Vendetta is at number three. It's a movie out of Italy with a PFV of 21.7. Troll, by the way, had a PFV of 44.4, which any other week would be easily enough to chop the chart. The Noel Diaries at number four with a PFV of 16.6, followed by The Swimmers at number five. Crime Scene, Texas Killing Fields is at number six with a PFV of 9.7, followed by Lady Chatterley's Lover at number seven with a PFV of 9.5, the latest Netflix remake of that classic tale. Slumberland stays on the list at number eight with a PFV of 8.9, followed by Christmas Full of Grace debuting on the list at number nine with a PFE of 8.8. .8. And then Warriors of the Future, which we saw in the box office charts earlier this year with a PFE of 7.1. Wednesday, as I mentioned, is doing incredibly well after less than two weeks on Netflix. It's actually already broken in to the top five as far as most watched programs by PFV this year. The Tender Swindler has dropped out of the top 10 altogether. The Adam Project remains number one, followed by Stranger Things 4. The Gray Man is at number three. Purple Hearts is at number four, but just behind Purple Hearts and making a play, maybe to even go as high as number three next week, is Wednesday. It's got over a quarter of a billion hours watched already and a PFE of 115.2, meaning 115.2 million potential finished views. Dahmer Monster drops to number six. Hustle drops to number seven. The Sea Beast drops down to number eight. Bridge Richardson season two drops to number nine and the man from Toronto drops to number 10 and Wednesday is also doing well enough that it's broken into the top 10 overall most watched Netflix programs since they started providing these numbers last June. It is currently at number nine on that list since June 28th, 2021, dropping Dahmer monster to number 10 and hustle out of the rankings altogether. It is just behind the Sandra Bullock movie, the unforgivable purple hearts and the gray man. Then things would break into the top five with stranger things Four. the Adam Project, Don't Look Up, Red Notice, and then Squid Game Season 1 with its 2.2 billion hours watched and 279.2 PFV. That is an insane number still. Let's look at the numbers that are provided by Nielsen. Now, these are a little bit different from the Netflix numbers. They're delayed by about a month. They don't cover all streamers, and they don't cover all devices. This is also based in the U.S. only, but it's a rough idea of what people are watching across different streaming services, or the best that we can do right now. Let's look first at the most watched streaming movies for the week of November 7th through the 13th. Enola Holmes 2 is at number one. Where the Crawdads Sing is at number two. Sony, I think, still getting some traction from being one of the only studios to license its 
its movie's first run to a streaming service. You can see that Where the Crawdads Sing, good enough for number two. Falling for Christmas, its debut week on the chart is at number three, just behind Where the Crawdads Sing, followed by Hotel Transylvania 2 at number four. Don't Worry Darling and its debut on HBO Max, generating 4.8 million hours watched at number five. Black Panther on Disney Plus, people getting ready for the release of Black Panther Wakanda Forever by watching the original to the tune of 4.8 million hours watched. The original Enola Holmes at number seven with 4.4 million hours watched. Then The Good Nurse on Netflix at number eight. Mile 22 on Netflix in addition to the chart at number nine. And Sing 2 returning to the chart at number 10. Looking at the most watched streaming shows for November 7th through the 13th, Manifest on Netflix continued to rack up big hours watched domestically, 38.1 million hours watched, good enough to beat the debut week of The Crown on Netflix with 35.4 million hours watched. That's not just the latest season, that's all seasons of The Crown combined. Love is Blind is at number three, Coco Melon is at number four, NCIS is at number five, Bluey on Disney Plus returns to the chart at number six with 11.4 million hours watched, followed by Gilmore girls. Yellowstone is at number eight with 10.1 million hours watched, but you can see there that this is streamed on Peacock and a lot of people might be confused because they said like, well, wait a minute, Yellowstone is on Paramount Plus, is it not? Well, yes, Yellowstone is actually on Paramount Plus, but before Yellowstone got so popular, Paramount Plus licensed the streaming rights to previous seasons of Yellowstone to Peacock, which means that if you're watching new episodes of Yellowstone, you have to watch them on Paramount Plus, but if you want to watch old episodes of Yellowstone, you have to go over to Peacock. Oh, this licensing of the streaming wars, isn't it great? At number nine is the debut of Warrior Nun on Netflix, and at number 10 on the list is The Blacklist, also on Netflix. But I also like to look at something I call watch time per episode. How many hours are being generated by each specific episode on average for these shows? And at number one on watch time per episode is Inside Man because it only has four episodes averaging 1.72 million hours watched per episode. From Scratch on Netflix is at number two, generating over 1 million hours watched per episode. Then we have The Watcher at number three, Manifest at number four, Coco Melon at number five, The Crown at number six, Andor, which was missing from the overall top 20 last week, is back, and it's generating through 10 episodes, 700,000 hours of watch time per episode. So an example of a show that isn't doing the huge numbers compared to all of the other shows, but is generating some healthy watch time per episode. Warrior Nuns at number eight, Love is Blind at number nine, and Yellowstone at number 10 with 273,000 hours watched per episode. And that wraps up the show for this week. Coming up this weekend, we have, of course, the opening of Avatar The Way of Water. It is the only new wide release hitting theaters this weekend. Spoiler alert is expanding or continuing to expand, so it may well hit wide release. Moving into limited release this weekend are a number of movies, including The Quiet Girl. I've seen a lot of buzz around this one. This could be another movie that's kind of coming on a little bit late into the award season. Looking at the streaming world, National Treasure Edge of History has a two episode premiere on Disney Plus this Wednesday, and then several award season movies expanding on streaming services, including Bardo, the latest three-hour epic from Alexander Gonzalez and Yuritu. That hits Netflix this weekend. Nanny is hitting Prime this weekend. And then, as I mentioned before, Black Adam, also available this weekend on HBO Max. Thank you so much for watching the show. Thank you to my partner, Carbon Health. Thank you to my sponsors, Raycon and Athletic Greens, the makers of AG1. Later this week, I've got a video on the site and sound poll, more reviews, a lot of stuff as we close down the year. I'm excited to talk about all of it with you. Until then, stay safe, and I'll see you then. Bye.